So they all came to the liberty movement in different ways. Um, you know, it, it used to be sort of Ayn Rand and uh, Heinlein were the ways that people found out about the liberty movement. I'm sure there's, there's some of you here that uh, found out that way. For me, it was Harry Brown, uh, the presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party, 1996-2000. And I felt that he was, well, this is a monster man. He was a big man, and he, and, he, and he gave such a compelling speech, and he knew how to articulate these things in a way that people can internalize for themselves. And I found him to be extraordinarily moving, and he changed so many of my thoughts. And, you know, it's, it's like popping rivets on the uh, statist machine as, as you kind of you know, move down this path of liberty. But there's a man among us now who uh, worked with Harry Brown. I believe he was uh, the media manager for Harry Brown. And once the campaign was over, oddly, the libertarian candidate didn't win. Once the, <laughs> once the, uh, the, the election was over, he founded Downsize DC. Downsize DC is an organization all about liberty, all about bringing the power back to the people, back to the states. And he's the perfect guy to be uh, giving this speech. And Jim Babka's full-time job is liberty. He is a blogger, he's a writer, he's a talk show host, and besides being the, uh, the president of Downsize DC, he's a uh, giant among men, the Ayatollah of Rock and Roll, Jim Babka. Well, I like being called a giant among men. <laughs> One of the very first times I got to go out on the road and speak, I got to meet somebody who was on my email list but had not had uh, not met me personally yet. Sat down at a breakfast table with him, and he found out who I was, and the conversation continued. And at one point, and you'd have to know this gentleman to fully appreciate this, he turned and looked at me and he said, Gee, Jim, I really expected you to be taller than you were. I said, Yes, so did I. <laughs> you know, we were just a couple of weeks ago, we were in Cincinnati, Ohio, and that's been referenced here in Bryce's speech. In fact, uh, I want to thank Bryce for stealing a great deal of my talk, wherever you are, Bryce. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we were at the National Underground Railroad, Railroad Freedom Center. And we were there in Cincinnati, Ohio, in, this, in that location because we wanted to tell an important story, not just in the words that we said, but in the place that we were standing. We wanted to make clear for all these people who are trying to characterize our movement as somehow or other bigoted or oppressive, where we really stood, that we stood in defense of the individual. And since we were in the National Underground Railroad Museum, uh, several of the speakers were asked to kind of, you know, say some things that, uh, in our talk, to kind of maybe put a focus on that has something to do with the idea of nullification in terms of the Underground Railroad. You see, because one of the things, interesting things that you learned, I learned even that night and that day, was that there's the word nullification appeared in that museum only one time that I could count. We toured it earlier in the day. And that was in a display describing John Calhoun, a senator from South Carolina who was perhaps the most pro-slavery slavery senator in the United States Senate at the time, pre-Civil War. And South Carolina, of course, was the very first state to secede. That's the only place where that word was found there. So there's kind of a misunderstanding. So what can I bring to this conversation? Well, Henry David Thoreau came to my mind. And he's coming to my mind even more so this morning as I passed the people who greeted us this morning. Because so many of these people, I mean, I, I can say left-wing historians and, and environmentalists and people who engage in anti-war uh, acts of civil disobedience have, have such admiration for Henry David Thoreau. But the fact is, they don't really know him. They don't know the real Thoreau. I mean, how many people that were out there this morning would cotton the quotes like this? This is how he opened his book, Civil Disobedience. I heartily accept the motto that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it rapidly deployed. Then we could get to the point where our motto would be, that government is best which governs not at all. <laughs> well, how many of the people outside would like this quote? He said, the authority of government must have the sanction and consent of the governed. It can have no pure right over my person and property but what I concede to it. I, Henry Thoreau, do not wish to be regarded 
As a member of any incorporated society which I have not joined, I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state to be able to withdraw and stand aloof from it. I'm only giving you a small sample of some of the things that Henry Draper Thoreau said. In fact, if you were there in Cincinnati, we actually went quite a bit deeper, and the quotes just get more radical from there. He really was one of us, not one of them. And so I think, if you don't know Thoreau, you shouldn't quote him. But I, we, Thoreau I thought of in particular because his family was involved in the National, they are involved in the Underground Railroad program. His family was abolitionists. Thoreau wrote in his journal of helping slaves escape the South. And Massachusetts was a state that had formed, that had actually passed the nullification of slavery, of the Fugitive Slave Act in particular. They said, we're not going to return slaves. We're not going to participate in the kidnapping of human beings. None of our government employees are going to participate in this. Despite the fact that they passed the nullification rule, though, in 1851 and again in 1854, slaves were kidnapped from Massachusetts and sent back, and Thoreau got very upset, sat down and wrote an essay called Slavery in Massachusetts. He talked about the governor and described how useless he was. He said the whole military force of the state is at the service of a Mr. Subtle, a slaveholder from Virginia, to enable him to catch a man whom he calls his property, but not a soldier's office offered to save the citizens of Massachusetts from being kidnapped. This is no governor of mine, he went on to say. In fact, he reflected on this a bit more, and he thought about the office of governor itself. He thought about whether or not we even need such an office. He said, uh, of, the, of that office, I think I could manage to get along without one. If he is not of the least use to prevent my being kidnapped, pray, of what important use is he likely to be to me? <laughs> So this is the stuff that I thought of as we were there, and this is kind of the cause, the reason, because, you know, when the South Carolina, Senator Calhoun State, did secede, if you read their statement of secession, they spend the better part of the beginning of it explaining why they had the grounds to do it, where they got their legal authority for separating from the Union. But the very first complaint that they registered, and I'm about to tell you something you'll never hear on Chris Matthews, the very first complaint they registered was that they couldn't be in union with lawless states, states that did not respect the rule of law, because you see, the fugitive slave law was the law of the land, and, they, and property was being stolen from them. That's how they viewed these people, was property. Their property was being stolen, the, some northern states were aiding and abetting this theft, and they could not be in union with people who did not respect the law. That's the first complaint in their secession statement. So I think it's important. A lot of the talk that you're going to hear today is going to be of this nature that I just gave you. It's going to be the ethical or the moral or the practical uh, reasons why, why, why you should embrace this tactic called nullification. Why it should be an important part of our toolkit. I'm from DownsizeDC.org and we're busy every day trying to lobby Congress. We're trying to educate the powerful. We give you a tool that you can use where you can tell your representative and senators where you stand, where you can, because ostensibly they're supposed to be your representative, you can give them your working orders for the day, okay? So we're going to circulate some clipboards so you have an opportunity to sign up for the Downsizer Dispatch while I'm giving my talk, and I hope you will take advantage of doing that. And I'm going to tell you more about what it is that we're doing later. But I base what I'm going to say to you on my work or my activism at Downsize DC, because we practice what we preach. So I'm going to share not just why you should do nullification today, but how. I want to give you some steps that you can actually take. What can you do? How can you be effective at using this tactic? And I'll draw from the experience, we're, 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 what we're trying to do, at downsizedc.org. In our experience, I'm going to sum up in two words. We have to first of all have to understand, all of us here that are interested in nullification, interposition. And second, we have to understand incentives. Let's start with interposition. John Calvin, famous reformer, first wrote down the words, interposition of the lower magistrate. This was an idea that was carried on by many of the Presbyterian and Reform leading lights in the, in the decades that followed, including a man by the name of Samuel Rutherford, who wrote a, 
a piece called Lex Rex, Law Before the King, because you see it was always the king before the law before. He said, no man emerges from the womb with a sword in his hand and a crown on his head. We're all equal. We all have this thing. In fact, if we talk about Thoreau more, we see the quotes he had about the importance of conscience. Each of us has the ability to govern the world. Yeah. Um, so interposition is an important tactic. And this idea of the lower magistrate, to simply sum this up, everybody, from the local dog catcher all the way up to the President of the United States, swears an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. That is to whom they owe their obligation. The dog catcher is not answerable to the President or the Congress or the Governor in the same way that he is answerable first to the Constitution. And that is where we derive this right. That is why we call ourselves Tenth Amendment, a Tenth Amendment group. Because we believe that every one of these officials is accountable to the Constitution first. And the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are very specific. The, ninth, the Tenth Amendment says that the, that the power isn't specifically spelled out in the document, the government, federal government simply does not have it. And so we want every one of these politicians to stand up for us. And that's essentially what you're asking them to do here locally. The purpose of the government, ostensibly, is that it's going to protect your rights. It's going to protect you from force and fraud. And that's not what's happening right now. So we're asking to get these folks who are in capitals everywhere to stand up and interpose on our behalf. The problem is they're very unlikely to. They're very unlikely to. And you know why that is? It has to do with our second eye, incentives. The incentives, ladies and gentlemen, are all wrong. They're upside down, inside out, candy moments. They're just bad. Needy, people-pleasing politicians have a very, very hard time saying no to special interests that come to Washington looking for a special favor, a special break, looking for a contract, looking to regulate their competition out of business in some way, very hard time saying no, because you see, no might learn animosity towards them. They might be an enemy. Yes, yes, might get them a friend. Yes, might get them financial support for future campaigns. Yes, open so many doors, maybe even a job after they leave. Yes, it's such a wonderful word for them. They get to make people happy. That's what they're all about. It's competing interests. Who can they make happy? So let me say to you, the most important thing that I think I could say to you all day. And that is the most important question in politics is you and what are we? You and what are we? Are you, in order to be successful, in order to get to achieve what you want to accomplish, you are going to need to have an army that's so big, so powerful, that it makes politicians uncomfortable. It's that simple. That is the most important thing I can say to you. You've got to be able to put that pressure on them. Now, at downsizedc.org, the way we do it, as I started describing before, is we have this lobbying system. We have a system where you can put in your basic contact information. The system tells you who your representatives, you senators are. It allows you to send a personalized message to them. And the best part about this is you're not alone. Because we've sent out the downside of this batch and we've given talking points to thousands of other people. More than 31,000 people get our email every day. We tell you what's going on, what Congress is up to. Now I do this for a very specific reason. Because the problem that we face is the difference between concentrated benefit, concentrated, uh, benefit and dispersed costs. For the, for, the, for the people coming and looking for favors from politicians, it's simply a matter of going to lobby. It's an investment. They hire the right people. They get the contract. It's a real good deal for them. But think of us. Who are spending, who, for, who, for whom these programs and these regulations cost nickels and dimes and quarters and dollars every month, every week maybe, or perhaps every day. But how many of us have the time or are willing to put in the effort to go march on Washington or mount a large political campaign to undertake the massive cost that we have to undertake to defend ourselves to save that nickel, that quarter, that dime, that dollar? This is where the incentives are upside down. This is where they're backwards. How do we turn this thing around? Our mechanism, we designed to make it as simple as we possibly could, and we're committed to building even more tools that are going to make it as simple as we can for people to respond. 
to kind of reverse this dispersed cost problem and begin to put the burden on the politicians. And we want to regulate the politicians. Let me give you an example of what it is I'm talking about here. We have a bill that Downsize DC proposed, the one we're best known for. There's a whole agenda there that's almost all of it's as interesting as what I'm going to share with you now. So I encourage you to come to downsizedc.org and check it out. But this bill that we're probably best known for is called the Read the Bills Act. <laughs> Bills Act does a couple of basic things. First, it says that before a congressman can vote yes, can vote in the affirmative, to pass a new law, to regulate you in some way, create a new program, or pass a levy tax on you, they have to sign an affidavit saying that they've either read the bill for themselves or they've heard it read to them. I like this word read to in part. Because the Constitution, we keep coming back to that defines a quorum in the Congress as 50% plus one of the members. And what we say is that 50% plus one of the members has to sit and listen to a word-for-word, -word, in order reading of the entire bill by the clerk from start to finish. Woo! And you know why we do this? Because, as you all, if you were starting to know while you're sitting here listening to me, the mind will procure what the hiney will endure. And ladies and gentlemen, if they have to sit and listen to their entire bills, we will get fewer of them and they will be shorter. Yes. <laughs> but we're not done. We also were inspired by the fact that back in the 90s, Congress got the brilliant idea that we were so dangerous to each other that if we were going to purchase a firearm, we needed a seven-day cooling off period. Think about it. So we thought, okay. We're going to give Congress a seven-day waiting period, too, before they assault us with legislation, during which they have to post a bill online for you to be able to read, for watchdog groups like DC.org, for your favorite radio talk show so that you know what's in the bill at the time that, you're, that is a, it's of most importance, right before they're going to vote. That's the real vote. Now, you know, I may sound like a naive dreamer as I say this. You say to me, folks, Jim, there's no way that Congress is going to obey its own rules. Isn't it sad that the people who make our laws are the lawless, lawless bunch in the land? We actually, we actually expect them not to follow these rules. I mean, we expect it. And so do we at Downsize DC. So we actually didn't make this a rule. You probably heard talk of a 24 hour sunshine bill or 72 hours to read their bills. We're not talking about a simple rule, we're actually talking about a law with teeth. You see, because under the downsized DC proposal, and this is just one example of our enforcement mechanism, if you find yourself guilty, but you're in a court, you're in a situation where they say you haven't paid a tax return, or you didn't follow a regulation that they passed, and they didn't follow the procedure, you can present the evidence to the judge, and the judge will throw the case out with impunity. So let them pass all the laws they want without following the rules. We won't have to abide by them. That's the Read the Bills Act. Now we. We have other bills that we put out here, and you, you notice there, we just, with the read the bills, we just took this concentrated benefits and dispersed costs, and we reversed it on the Congress. We just imposed the cost on them. They have to sit and listen to a bill being read, they have, which says they can only have one topic. <laughs> now, I say all this. We came to, you know, Mark uh, gave a great introduction to me. There was a little thing he left out in the introduction. In between the Harry Brown campaign and my time here as the president of DC.org, I was uh, the executive director of an organization called Real, Cam uh, yeah, Real Campaign Reform.org. We took a lawsuit all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court challenging the McCain Feingold Incumbent Protection Bill, because that's really what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we lost. One of our co-plaintiffs that actually was a group called Citizens United, which won a landmark case last year, started to reverse the tie on this issue. But when that decision came down, we realized that the door on elections had been closed. Now you people here in New Hampshire are in a unique position because you're able to elect a legislator, legislature, your districts are small enough that you're able to get some real representatives into that district. But let me tell you, for those of us in the other 49 states in this union, that ain't the case. Okay? It costs an awful lot of money for us to run our candidates. For an incumbent, if you want to you raise this money, it's a piece of cake. You just 
you know, uh, have an interest group that comes into town, you throw a rubber chicken dinner for the politician, he comes in and speaks, everybody fills out their checks, they put a little code in the bottom corner of the check so that the, Congress, the congressman knows who gave the check. The purpose of this is to make sure that they keep access to the congressman, that the interest group can always get their phone calls returned, always get an appointment with them if he needs to see them. They call this, con this concept of stacking these checks bundling, I call it clustering. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but for a, for a challenger, raising that same amount of money is like filling a swimming pool with a teaspoon. So when we got done with this case, we said, you know something? We've got to find another way to do this. We've got to find a way to fight these guys. We've got to get them where they're not. We've got to get them where they haven't regulated us completely out. We've got to get them in a way that's really good going to get to them. So let me tell you a little story. Now, here's a day that I imagine in the future. Because at DownsizeDC.org, we want to build that army so large that Congress cannot afford to ignore us. It's so big that we can get our message out everywhere every day. So I imagine a day when an incumbent congressman comes home to his district. And he arrives in the district and he's got a meeting with the editorial board of the newspaper. And the editorial board of the newspaper asks him, what are you going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act? He takes the questions and leaves there and he heads over to his campaign headquarters where he finds out that the phone's been ringing off the hook. You've been calling them. And they say, we're getting tons of calls, congressman. People want to know, when are you going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act? Frustrated. He's tired of hearing this, he goes out to get in a parade. You know, where they're sitting in the car and they're waving at you, because that's really, I want to wave, right? And he's waving to you, and he sees signs in the parade room that say, when are you going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act? He goes to a radio interview, a local show. It's a show he usually enjoyed appearing on in the past, and the host says, you know, I've heard this great idea, because ladies and gentlemen, I haven't found a single radio host on the show that I've been on yet. I don't care where they're at the political spectrum, doesn't think the Read the Bills Act is a good idea. And they say, look, well, we're hearing about this Read the Bills Act, there's quite a bit of scurrying in the community. What are you going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act? And he is so frustrated now. He's so tired of hearing about this. He gets in his car and he's driving home, and as he's driving by, he sees a billboard. And it says, Congressman, when are you going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act? He gets to his home, it's late by this point, he's very tired, his wife's already in bed, so he quietly across, he slips underneath the covers, his wife rolls over on her side and says, honey, what are you going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when we have that kind of pressure, I promise you, they're going to sponsor the Read the Bills Act. They're going to do it. Because a politician is an opportunist. That's all they are. They're looking for a parade that's going somewhere. They want to pretend that they will not. It's their parade. So if you build this parade, if you build this army, your politicians will come. In fact, look at it this way. Instead of worrying about trying to get people elected, and, I, and as I said, for you in New Hampshire, maybe this advice doesn't fully apply the same way it does in the other 49 states. But instead of worrying so much about getting people elected, if we focused on building an army and demanding what it was that we wanted, old status politicians would be like dinosaurs. They would find the environment that we have created so inhospitable, so fun, that like Senator By last year from Indiana stepped down from the Senate because Congress wasn't fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I want to happen. I don't want them to be comfortable. Do you? No. But on the flip side, remembering that politicians are attracted to parades, if you build your own parade, guess what's going to start to happen? They're going to start to come. In fact, if you start to change the environment, you're going to start to hear candidates that sound completely different. You're going to start to sound a lot more like you. <laughs> That's how we're going to go, go about doing this. And you know what? They have to keep these doors open. They have to hear from their constituents. It's their lifeblood. It's their business. They've got to communicate with us. They can't shut us out. They've got to hear. How are they going to get elected if they're unwilling to talk to us? We wouldn't have to talk to them. I don't know. So these are the opportunities that are available. And I share all of what we're doing here in this manner with you to say that if you want to be successful in Nullify, that you're going to have to do something with your local politicians, your state politicians. You are going to have to give them a spine transplant. <laughs> and you know who the spine is? You are. You're the spine. You are the person that will be able to, get, to give them the strength to stand up and do the right thing and to stand up to those forces who are telling them to do the wrong thing. You will be the one that has that power. 
I hope that, the, that what I shared with you here this morning will, is of value to you and that you will follow it because at downsizedc.org, what we're doing requires your help. Yes, we're doing everything we can, and I hope you'll participate because we're not really asking that much. I hope you participate in our campaigns to tell Congress what they should be doing, how they should be doing their job at downsizedc.org. But we need other complementary tools, and one of those tools we need is notification. We need strong, vibrant movement. If you keep in mind these ideas of concentrated benefits in this first clause, trying to reverse that incentive, if you keep in mind, even more importantly, that you need to build the army, you need to have a parade that serves as the, as the representative or senator's conscience, you can have this kind of power too. You can even change the political environment. So I hope you'll take these words to heart, that you'll utilize them, and that you'll be very, very successful. It's been such a pleasure to be here in the live, free, and die state. Thank you, and God bless you.